is Order. not enough. Senator Green. It is not thank good you. enough. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My uh, question is to the Minister representing the, min uh, the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. The Morrison government promised uh, 4 million cora uh, coronavirus vaccines would be administered by the end of March. How many vaccines have been administered to date? And how many will be administered by the 31st of March? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thanks, Senator Dodson, for the question. Mr. President, the um, Senator's right. The government laid out a plan to roll out vaccination to Australians across the country um, to protect them against COVID 19 and to, of course, allow the Australian economy to re return to normal. Well, Mr President, I'll take the interjection, and, and, and I think it is actually is going quite well, Mr President. We've had, some, we've had some interruption to our supply from international sources, and, Mr President, everybody would understand that. Mr President, and so, to date, over 200,000 Australians have received their uh, vaccination uh, across the country, and that number continues that, that number continues to ramp up as we extend the, uh, the rollout of vaccination. And Mr. President, uh, today we've announced that um, the, the facilities, the GP services, that will start vaccinating Australians over a thousand sites around the country in phase 1B as of next week. We continue to build and grow the vaccination process for Australia as vaccination. Uh, as vaccines become available uh, and as the capacity of the system is built, Mr. President. So we have today vaccinated over 200,000 Australians and we continue to grow that. We continue to build the capacity of the, of the system in Australia to do that through uh, GPs, as of next week, through uh, Commonwealth vaccination clinics, uh, through um, through, through those processes, and of course, the states are currently rolling out their vaccines at varying rates. I must, I must admit, Mr. President, but the states are rolling out their vaccines to their frontline health workers as a part of Phase 1A, Mr. President. Order, so Senator the Colbeck. Time for the order on my left. Senator Dodson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Prime Minister has told uh, this Parliament that economic confidence will be, and I quote reinforced by the rollout of the vaccination program. What impact will the Morrison government's failure to deliver on its promise to administer 4,000 vaccines by the end of March have on the economy and jobs? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I'm glad someone else has trouble with numbers, uh, Mr President. And I accept that the, the, the number that uh, Senator Dodson was talking about was 4 million, not 4,000. Uh, so, Mr President, uh, I, I, re I reject the base premise of the question that Senator Dodson put um, in the context of uh, where the government's situation sits. He's right, though, in the context of the confidence that it will give to Australians uh, as, the, as the vaccine rolls out, Mr. President. But as we all know, as we all Order. know, we have had some Order. constraint in supply from overseas, Mr. President. We we have had some Order. constraint. In, in supply from overseas, Mr. President, and and the opposition might like try, to try and downplay that, but that is a reality. We've always Order accepted on my that, that was, an, uh, was was an issue that we might confront. But we are Senator in a very Gallagher. fortunate position, Mr. President, to have sovereign supply in this country, and we will continue to roll that in the uh, Order, that Senator out in the Colbeck, interest of Australia. The answer has expired. Order. Senator Dodson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, given the effect of the slow rollout of the vaccination program on the economy and jobs, is the Morrison government reconsidering ending JobKeeper in just 11 days? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, the government's position with respect to JobKeeper, I think, is very well understood. That has been made public 
uh, on a number of occasions, and so that's, that, that, is, that is exceptionally well understood, Mr. President. Uh, but we will continue to, to build and grow the rollout of the vaccine with the objective of having Australians have their first dose of the vaccine by the end of October, which was always our, always our target, Mr. President. Order. We said that we would start the vaccination process in, in February, and we've done that. We've said that we would start the rollout of phase 1B in, uh, in March, and we are doing that, Mr. President. And we will continue to build and develop the rollout of vaccines across, across the country to ensure that. Uh, Australians can be protected from coronavirus and, Mr President, that the Australian economy can continue to recover from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Order. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on the impact of COVID-19 on Papua New Guinea and advise how Australia is supporting our close friend and neighbour? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Macdonald for her very important question. Uh, Mr President, as the Prime Minister and I uh, announced this morning, Australia is standing with Papua New Guinea as they respond to a serious and widespread outbreak in COVID cases. The Prime Minister, the Minister for International Development in the Pacific and I and our High Commissioner in uh, Port Moresby have been in regular contact with our Papua New Guinea colleagues uh, and the Papua New Guinea government on how we can partner to assist in the response effort. Mr President, 2,479 cases have been officially reported, which is a surge of over 1,180 since the 27th of February. While the outbreak is concentrated in Port Moresby, there are cases in provinces across Papua New Guinea, and sadly there have been 31 recorded deaths. Australia has responded to our nearest neighbour and our Pacific family, uh, indeed through the pivot of our aid program under our Partnerships for Recovery and our COVID-19 response plans. The work that we've announced today is in strong partnership with Papua New Guinea based on their priorities and their needs. I noted earlier that our High Commissioner has been working closely with the Papua New Guinea government uh, to ensure our support is well targeted to Papua New Guinea's needs. Uh, indeed, his team are also part of Papua New Guinea's national COVID-19 technical working group. Uh, over the last week, Australia has assisted to increase the number of beds available for COVID patients uh, and funded St John's Ambulance Service Papua New Guinea to increase its capacity. That's for patient transport, for COVID testing, for PPE distribution to clinics. Uh, Australia has also added ballast to Papua New Guinea's National Control Centre. Uh, from our own experience, we know that communications, that risk and quarantine management are absolutely critical. We will work closely with our partners in Papua New Guinea, uh, Mr President, particularly the health authorities and the National Control Centre in addressing this crisis. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Will the minister advise what further support Australia can provide to Papua New Guinea? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. With the agreement of Papua New Guinea, uh, Australia will provide 8,000 vaccine doses from our stocks to fill a critical gap, while the COVAX facility, to which Australia has also contributed, uh, prepares to deliver vaccines to Papua New Guinea. That focus will be for frontline workers who are very exposed uh, at the moment. We're also providing $144 million to support Papua New Guinea's priorities and planning in their own vaccine program. With the agreement of Papua New Guinea, Australia is also asking AstraZeneca and European authorities to access one million doses of our contracted supplies for Papua New Guinea. Uh, today, Mr President, Defence will transport uh, 2,000 tents for safe triaging, referral and transfer of patients outside Port Moresby General Hospital. We'll provide surgical masks, uh, P295 respirator masks, protective gowns and goggles, gloves, sanitizer and face shields. And our OSMAT team, which arrives on Monday, will work with Papua Order. New Guinea authorities on infection control, Senator triage and McDonald's, public health measures. A final supplementary question. Will the Administrator advise how keeping Australians safe from COVID-19 requires us to also provide assistance to our close neighbours and also to keep our borders strong in far north Queensland? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, as the government has announced, from tonight we will suspend passenger flights from Papua New Guinea to Cairns for a two-week period. Uh, I want to ensure, assure, that, uh, assure colleagues and assure the Senate that freight will continue uh, to make sure that the movement of essential and humanitarian supplies uh, is available and continues for Papua New Guinea. 
We will also suspend charter flights from Papua New Guinea with limited exemptions. Uh, we will reduce passenger caps from Port Moresby to Brisbane. Uh, we will suspend outbound travel exemptions to Papua New Guinea other than for essential workers. Australia and Papua New Guinea are working in partnership to prevent cross-border transmission, including in the Torres Strait, where, of course, family and cultural cross-border connections are strong. Our vaccine support will also include Papua New Guinea's western province. Non-government organisations will play an important role in community engagement and mobilisation activities for these programs. I also want to acknowledge the uh, support of Warren Edge, the member for Leichhardt, Payne, and Queensland Health, which is cooperating in the vaccination effort. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In my home state of New South Wales, more than 350,000 workers will be affected by the Morrison government ending JobKeeper in just 11 days. How many of the more than 350,000 workers will lose their jobs? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. And, uh, well, indeed, I, I reject uh, uh, the interjection that was made before I'd even started uh, started my response there from Senator Watt. Uh, what uh, what our government is confident of, and indeed, and indeed, the advice that has been received uh, from and made public in various statements by the Governor of the Reserve Bank, uh, by the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, is to expect to continue to see jobs growth and jobs recovery as a result uh, of the continued stimulus and activity going in across the Australian economy. JobKeeper has absolutely saved many jobs. JobKeeper, in fact, has saved more than 700,000 jobs on the estimates, of, Order, on the estimates of experts. Other measures we've put in place, for example, the tax cuts that I was talking in this chamber about yesterday, putting an extra $1 billion a month into the pockets of Australian households are continuing to drive extra economic activity and extra support. The $1.2 billion package announced in recent weeks in relation to support for the aviation, travel and tourism sectors will again provide additional activity job support across the Australian economy. The fact that the investment incentive measures we put in place and the loss carryback measures that are there provide additional support for businesses across the Australian economy and continue to underpin jobs. Now, JobKeeper was, as we always said, intended to be temporary, Mr President, a temporary targeted measure. And what those opposite seem to forget is that's also what the Labor Party also called for. Now, Mr sorry, Albanese, Senator, Senator Mr Birmingham, Albanese. I have Senator O'Neill on a point of order. Senator O'Neill. There was only one question, so my point is with regard to relevance. I know that um, Senator uh, Senator Birmingham will roll out the list. But the question is on behalf of workers, 350,000 of them affected by the, sh the shutdown of JobKeeper in 11 days. And my question asked one thing. How many of the more than 350,000 workers will lose their jobs? Uh, they want to know Senator this information, Renew, I've, President. I've allowed you to restate your question. I, it, the minister was directly talking about the subject matter, which was about the employment impact of that particular policy. So I believe he has been directly relevant, as I can't instruct him how to answer a question, nor to accept the terms of a question. Senator Birmingham, to continue. Thanks, Mr President. So we know plenty of jobs have been saved. We know we've seen growth month after month in terms of new jobs across the Australian economy. And we also know that Mr Albanese said that JobKeeper will need a tapering off. He said that back in May last year. Back in May last year, he said it would need a tapering Order, off. Senator Birmingham, and that is precisely what this government has done. Has expired. Order. 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 I'll call Senator O'Neill when there's order. Senator Watt. Always not good to be the last voice heard, always. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr President. More than 110,000 businesses in New South Wales will be impacted by the JobKeeper ending in just 11 days with $345 million withdrawn from the local economy each fortnight. How many of the more than 110,000 New, New South Wales businesses will close? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, 813,600 
That's the number of jobs created in the last eight months. 813,600 jobs added back into the Australian economy. 93 per cent of those who had lost work at the height of the pandemic back in work. And the government delivering on its policies as we had always outlined and promised. We always said that our target, that our policies in response to this would be targeted and they'd be proportionate. We always said that JobKeeper would taper, would taper off, as indeed the opposition had called for. We also always said that it would come to an end at the appropriate time, as also the opposition called for. Because Mr Albanese said that we need a sensible, pragmatic transition out of the order. process. Senator, out of the process. Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Birmingham had eight, eight seconds left, I believe. Senator Watt? On relevance, in the remaining eight seconds, perhaps the minister would care to answer the question, which is how many more of the more than 110,000 businesses will close? I was listening carefully to the ministers. I, I, Senator Watt, I'm ruling. Miss Senator Watt, I, I, I can't. In a point of, I allow points of order to emphasise the point of a question, but with respect, I believe the minister was being directly relevant. You're asking me to instruct him to answer in certain terms. He was specifically talking about the policy raise. Um, you've made your point and there's an opportunity to debate the merits of answers after question time. Senator Birmingham, have you concluded or do you have eight, you have eight seconds remaining? Order. Mr President, we're simply doing what the Labor Party used to call for, but of course, once again, they've changed their position for political expediency. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Order on my right and my left. Order. I'm calling Senator O'Neill for it. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. Kerry Glassick. Kerry Glassick, founding director of Venue 505 and the old 505 Theatre, the very venue Minister Fletcher used to launch the details of his Live Music Australia program, has said, and I quote, we have no future in New South Wales without JobKeeper. Venue 505 is closing at the end of March. What does the minister have to say to Kerry? Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. President, we have faced... Order on my left. We have faced a global economic disruption, the greatest since, the most significant since the Great Depression. Australia has managed to come through this, faring better than nearly Order any other left. nation. Than nearly any other nation. Now, it is not possible for government to guarantee the survival of every single business or of every single job. Order. What Senator government Arneal. needs to do is to Senator make sure that we continue the trajectory of economic growth and jobs growth that we have been on since the Senator depths Watt. of this crisis hit. And that is exactly what all of our policies are geared to do. Senator all Watt. of our policies are geared to keep businesses sustainable, to keep jobs growing, to generate more jobs. And with 813,000 jobs in the last eight months, those Order. policies Senator are Birmingham, clearly working. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. There were three Aboriginal deaths in custody last week, in one week, bringing the number to almost 500. We are only 3.3 per cent of this population. Next month marks the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody's final report. Our people are screaming for justice. What will you do to end Aboriginal deaths in custody? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And, uh, and these are serious issues that Senator Thorpe raises. Uh, all Aboriginal deaths in custody are tragedy, and every single death that occurs in custody are a tragedy. It is an ongoing problem and challenge for the nation. Uh, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are overrepresented in our adult and youth justice systems, uh, both as offenders and as victims, and that uh, indeed, while the rates of death in custody for Indigenous prisoners is lower than for non-Indigenous prisoners, any death in custody is one too many. As the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody found, the fundamental issue 
is that too many Aboriginal people are in custody too often. The new national agreement on closing the gap includes targets for reducing the rates of adult incarceration by at least 15 per cent, which is target 10, and for youth detention amongst Indigenous Australians by at least 30 per cent by 2031, which is target 11. And the Indigenous Advancement Strategy of the Government funds activities to complement the efforts of states and territories to improve justice and community safety outcomes for Indigenous Australians. Some $261.3 million has been committed in 2020-21 alone. We recognise the seriousness of these issues and through the Closing the Gap Agreement are committed to working with states and territories, but also most importantly, individual communities to seek and to overcome uh, and address these issues, but we know there is no quick or silver bullet to doing so. Uh, it is why, though, we have spelt out clear targets, clear funding, uh, and work to try to address uh, this tragedy uh, that Order. ensues. Sen Senator Thorpe, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This government needs to close their own gap. It's been 30 years since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody released its final report. The government refuses to implement all of the report's recommendations that could save black lives today. This would also prevent the loss, trauma and grief that we experience every Senator single Thorpe, day. Why haven't you done anything? The question has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, I understand that uh, an independent review into the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody uh, was conducted in 2017. At the time, it found that the Australian government and governments of all political persuasions uh, had fully or mostly implemented 91 per cent of recommendations for which the Australian government has responsibility. And it also found that 18 partially implemented recommendations have largely been superseded by subsequent government actions and policies, uh, that 78% uh, that of the 339 recommendations in total, noting that many of those related to states and territories uh, as the uh, operators of the judicial system, uh, have been fully or mostly implemented, 16% uh, partially implemented, uh, and that around 90% of recommendations relating to the order, safety of Indigenous Senator Australians Thorpe. taken into custody have been fully order, or mostly Senator implemented. Thorpe. Yes, point of order for misleading the chamber. Oh, sorry, Senator Thorpe. Um, a point of order can only be about compliance with the standing orders. Um, merits of answers can be debated after question time. Well, point of order on relevance, and the relevance being my question was around what is the government going to do about the recommendations, not give me a spiel on what recommendations have been implemented okay. or not implemented and a dodgy, dodgy Senator, report Senator Thorpe, please, that Senator they Thorpe, based Senator Thorpe, on desktop I've, 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 only. I've, I've, I've allowed you to um, make your point of order. There's an opportunity to debate the merits of answers after question time, but I believe the minister is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the, the point being the recommendations have overwhelmingly been implemented by governments of all persuasions, but acknowledging there continues Order, to be Senator a job Birmingham. to be done. Senator Thorpe, a final supplementary question. Again, there were three Aboriginal deaths in custody just last week alone. That's three families and communities that are now in terrible pain. What do you have to say to them? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I would say, and I imagine that I would be joined uh, by uh, all other senators, that we are deeply sorry for their anguish, for their loss, uh, for the pain felt, for the pain felt uh, in those families and those communities, for the circumstances that led to those individuals being in custody, for the failings in relation to in systems or in communities that brought them to the point of being in custody, but that we are determined to continue to try to find pathways to reduce the rate of Indigenous incarceration, that we will continue, as governments have been, state and territory, Commonwealth, Labor and Liberal,
to implement the recommendations and to go beyond the recommendations Order. in a number of other policies Order, and measures most recently outlined in the National Agreement on Closing the Gap and that we're committed to continue to work with Order. communities in partnership Order, to Billingham. achieve those Time outcomes. The answer has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Minister, can you advise the Senate on the progress of the national COVID-19 vaccine rollout, please? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Van, for his question. Mr President, we're now into week four of the mass vaccine rollout across Australia, and we are prioritising the most vulnerable in society, as we should, to receive the vaccine first, Mr President. Each week, each week more aged care residents Border, quarantine and frontline health workers have had the opportunity to receive their first dose of the vaccine. This week, Mr President, we also, also saw the start of the second dose round being administered, so we are now in the position to start to have fully immunised uh, citizens against the COVID-19 virus. Both the Pfizer uh, BioNTech and the AstraZeneca vaccine require two doses to be fully immunised. The Pfizer vaccine, 21 days apart, Mr. President, and the AstraZeneca vaccine, 12 weeks apart. Senator Van, I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that vaccines, vaccinations are gathering pace in your home state of Victoria. So far, more than 38,900 people in Victoria have had a jab against COVID. Next week, we will begin phase 1B of our vaccination program, which includes vulnerable groups, including older people, people with underlying medical conditions. Mr. President, we are enlisting general practices across the country to play a major role in the vaccination rollout and have been heartened by the enthusiasm of, vaccine, uh, of GPs to get on board our vaccination program. Uh, 1,100 will be commencing next week. Mr President, we thank all Australians, including our frontline workers, uh, GPs, for their commitment and hard work in rolling out the vaccination in this country. We are getting on with delivering the vaccine, and it will underpin our health and economic recovery. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank Order. you, Mr President. Can the minister also update the Senate on how many people have been vaccinated so far in Australia? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, as I've said earlier today, more than 203,500 Australians have been vaccinated as a part of our vaccination rollout so far, including more than 45,000 more than 45,000 aged care residents in over 500 aged care facilities. Indeed, we have been progressively ramping up our rollout in aged care homes, and today, 26 uh, facilities across the country will receive vaccinations, Mr President. Health care teams will also be vi visiting 35 aged care facilities for the second time to deliver second doses to our most vulnerable citizens. Mr President, in coming weeks the vaccination program will reach more than 2,500 residential aged care facilities and more than 183,000 residents will be vaccinated, uh, uh, including uh, uh, 339,000 staff. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister expand on how Australia's general pra practitioner GPs will assist with the mass vaccine rollout in the country? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and Senator Van, more than 1,000, in fact, more than 1,100 general practices will join the COVID vaccination program from next week. GP services will progressively come online from March 22, which is what we said would happen uh, when we announced the vaccination rollout program. By the end of April, we will have more than 4,000 GP services assisting us with the vaccination program. This staged scale-up will align with the supply of AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca vaccine, and as more vaccine becomes available, more services will come online. There are six million people in the second phase of the vaccine rollout, and I want to assure Australians that everyone who wants a vaccine will get one, but, Mr President, I would also urge them to be patient. As the vaccine becomes available, we will make it available to Australians. Senator Gallagher. 
Order. On my right, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thanks, Mr President. And my question is to the Acting Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Defence Minister Senator Reynolds promised last year to secure a contracted requirement of 60 per cent minimum local content for the future submarines program. Can the Acting Minister for Defence confirm that this contractual agreement has still not been finalised? And when will the revised contract actually be finalised? The Acting Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Gallagher for his question. The government, of course, expects defence industry doing business uh, with Australia to meet their commitments, to manage their costs and to deliver projects on time and according to our specifications. And that, Mr President, will not be done at the expense of Australian jobs and Australian industry. In the case of the attack class submarine, we expect that Naval Group's commitment to spend a minimum of 60 per cent of their contract value in Australia will be finalised as a matter of priority. As we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has never been more important for the government to back in Australian industry, and that is what we are going to do. We have been very clear that we will not agree to provisions in the strategic partnering agreement that are not meaningful and measurable over the long duration of the program or dilute the protections we currently have. The government is a strong client and will maintain a fit-for-purpose agreement for decades to come. Mr President, I am advised that Defence and Naval Group have made progress on the agreement, with details being worked through to finalise the amendments to the strategic partnering agreement. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr President. The Chief Executive of the Australian Industry and Defence Network uh, Mr Brent Clark has said that the agreement, and I quote, will go to the very heart of our, how Australian industry is to be brought into the supply chain for the submarine and that it needs to be made public to ensure transparency. Is Mr Clark wrong? Senator Payne. Mr President, I haven't seen the specific remarks of Mr Clark, so I'll take those uh, on face value from Senator Gallagher, of course. Um, I do want to be clear about the amendments to the strategic partnering agreement, though, because they'll detail provisions that apply to Naval Group's achievement of the commitment, including both remedies and incentives. And as with all provisions in the strategic partnering agreement and, indeed, other major defence contracts, as Senator Gallagher is well aware from his extended period of time on committees that deal with these matters in the parliament, the specifics of these amendments will remain commercially sensitive. Similar to our other projects, AIC performance will, of course, remain subject to parliamentary scrutiny through the Senate estimates process, and the program will remain the subject, as it has been, of ongoing regular reviews by the ANAO. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Acting Minister of Defence, Senator Payne, has previously argued against a local minimum contact content requirement in contracts for the future attack class submarines, asserting it would create a ceiling, not a floor on local content. Is this why the Acting Minister will refuse to reveal details of any Australian content requirement, as reported in today's Australian Financial Review? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. The answer to Senator Gallagher's question is no. Uh, I've been clear in relation to uh, the finalisation of the 60 per cent AIC commitment, uh, the nature of the protection of the provisions in terms of the uh, uh, commercial sensitivity of those, uh, and they are matters, as I said, of which Senator Gallagher is well aware. Uh, Mr President, in concluding my answer, may I also seek the indulgence of the Senate to refer to uh, the members of the National Rural Women's Coalition muster who are here in the gallery in the Senate chamber today, from Christmas Island to Pakenham and Hamilton to Noosa Shire and Weeper to Wagga Wagga and multiple locations in between. May I welcome them to the Senate? Yeah. Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Could the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting small business and the Australian economy to recover strongly from COVID-19, including through our plan for lower taxes, which is giving Australian households and small businesses more of their money back? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Rennick for his question. And, uh, Mr. President, the Morrison government, those of us on this side of the chamber, the one thing we well and truly all agree on is that tax cuts well and truly benefit the economy. We believe that lower taxes 
are the best way for our economy to thrive. What do they do, Mr President? Well, they put more money in the pockets of hard-working Australians. And of course, that money is the money of those hard-working Australians, so we're really giving it back to them. But we're also putting money back into the pockets of small businesses. And as we know, when a small business uh, gets by with a tax cut, they actually in, uh, invest back into their business. And that's a good thing for all Australians. Mr President, since last July, about $9 billion, $9 billion in tax cuts has landed in the pockets of around 8.8 .8 million Australians. $9.9 billion in tax cuts has landed in the pockets of around 8.8 .8 million Australians. This is money that has been returned back to them. And what has it done? Well, it's boosted household balance sheets. And what we've also seen is consumer confidence rise now above pre-pandemic levels. And, Mr President, we're not stopping there, though. A further $2 billion per month in tax cuts will flow to Australians between now and the end of September. Why is that, Mr President? Because the Morrison government, we believe in giving people back their hard-earned money by way of reducing their taxes. And, Mr President, what that also means for small businesses is that when households are able to keep more of their money, $9 billion now back in the uh, pockets of families, they are able to go out and support those local businesses. And, of course, when you support a local business, what you're ultimately doing is supporting jobs. And that's what this government is all about, supporting jobs in the economy. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Wow, that was fantastic. Well done, Senator Cash. What additional support is the government providing to our three and a half million small business owners as Australia emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic impacts? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr President, I think those on the other side just said not enough. Well, guess what? Guess what? We're providing them with a further tax cut. And as you know, Mr President, uh, what we're doing for small business builds on the government's record of actually reducing tax cuts for small business or reducing taxes for small business, something those on the other side just don't agree with. And we'll get to that shortly. We'll get to that shortly. Mr President, last year we reduced the small business company tax rate to 26%. These changes, of course, are a part of what the Morrison government is doing to accelerate small business tax cuts. Uh, we also brought forward that tax relief um, for SMEs by five years. In fact, Mr President, under the Morrison government, small businesses are paying the lowest company tax rate since 1967. But, Mr President, we're not stopping there. We will now reduce that. The small business company tax rate will fall to 25 per cent on the 1st of July. Because we know when you back small Order, business, Senator you back Cash. jobs. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Can Senator O'Neill. Senator, Senator Rennick. Senator O'Neill. Senator Rennick. Can the minister outline why the Morrison government's strong and effective record of supporting Australia's three and a half million small businesses through tax relief, red tape uh, reduction and hiring incentives is so critical to our economic recovery as well as any risks that, as well as any risks that small businesses and their employees face during the next phase of our economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, I've got to take that very quiet interjection from the Leader of the Opposition, Senator Wrong. Well, here we go. And you're right, Senator Wrong, here we go. Because it's important that the Australian people understand exactly what the Labor Party will commit to delivering to them if they were ever elected to office. It's not bad enough, it's not bad enough that they took to the last election a commitment to slug Australians' colleagues uh, with $387 billion worth of tax. $387 billion in taxes and of course then colleagues can you imagine the state of the economy if that had occurred and then COVID-19 had hit. But they didn't stop there. They didn't stop there. The former Leader of the Opposition, he has yet again confirmed to the Australian people that when it comes to lowering taxes, the Labor Party, they just don't believe there's any point. Because to quote him, this is what he said, what is the point of giving a tax cut. Well, Mr President, I'd ask all those hard-working Australians order, out Senator there Cash, who are Senator, benefiting order, from— Senator, I have Senator K um, Kitching on a point of order. Senator Kitching. Point of order is that that's misleading. The full quote was, what's the point of a I'm tax cut if you don't not have a job? Order, Senator Kitching. And Senator, uh, Senator Birmingham Kitching, misled the chamber Senator yesterday. Kitching, uh, Senator Kitching, 
all senators know that there is an opportunity to debate the merits of answers after question time. Points of order are not the appropriate time to raise the point of debate. I think Senator Cash, you had five seconds left while I was trying to, and Senator Cash has concluded her answer. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate representing the Prime Minister. The Attorney General has instituted legal proceedings against the national broadcaster, the ABC. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said, in an abundance of caution and to avoid any perception of conflicts of interest, the Attorney General will not perform certain functions that may relate to the federal court or the AB and the ABC. Could you please state each and every function the Prime Minister is referring to? Could you please list which roles and functions and which minister has, have each of these functions been delegated to? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And Mr President, I uh, uh, firstly uh, would make the point that the Attorney-General, as with any other Australian, are entitled to uh, initiate defamation proceedings, and they're entitled to do that against the ABC or anybody else who is alleged to have defamed them. He is still entitled to initiate defamation proceedings, Order. Senator Keneally. Order. In relation to the questions that Senator Hanson Young asked, I'd firstly point out uh, that at this point in time, uh, the Acting Attorney General, Senator Cash, fulfils all of the functions. Uh, of the Attorney General's responsibilities, assisted in the delegated responsibilities by Senator Stoker, the Assistant Minister to the Attorney General. The government, out of an abundance of caution, has sought advice from the Solicitor General in relation to the functions of the Attorney General to avoid any perception that any conflicts of interest may arise when he returns to fulfil his office. Out of caution, the government has indicated uh, that until that advice is finalised, the Attorney-General uh, and his office will not uh, perform certain functions that may relate uh, to the administration of the federal court uh, or to uh, the ABC, the administration of the federal court or to the ABC. The government is, as I said, seeking that advice from the Solicitor-General that will fully inform the practices and processes that are put in place upon the Attorney General's return to work. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like the Minister to take uh, the question on notice, given we don't have uh, the full list from him. Um, I'd like to know how the Attorney General, who has been accused of rape, is now suing the National Broadcaster for defamation, can oversee national consent laws. It is the establishment of a Commonwealth Integrity Commission, defamation law reform and, indeed, any other functions of the Attorney-General's portfolio. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. And, uh, and I note many across the parliament, past, president, including Senator Hanson Young, have used defamation laws at times. Oh. Now, the Attorney-General will return to his office informed Order informed by the advice of the solicitor general around the conduct around the conduct of those duties i can't take the first question on notice to preempt the advice and information of the solicitor general uh, but certainly uh, we will make sure uh, that it is transparent to all once that advice is received and the attorney returns to work about exactly the procedures that are put in place where there are duties that need to be fulfilled uh, by Senator Stoker, we have full confidence that the Assistant Minister, the Attorney General, will fulfil those duties fully and with absolute competence and confidence. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Prime Minister ensure that the Attorney General is recused from all cabinet discussions relating to the ABC, including budget deliberations? Right. Senator Birmingham. Uh, Mr President, I note that the, uh, the lists of members of Cabinet committees are published. The Attorney General is not a member of the Expenditure Review Committee of Cabinet. But if there are, if there, if decisions, if decisions, Senator Wong, if decisions are taken in relation to the management of any perceived or potential conflicts of interest, then those decisions will be consistently applied across all ministerial and cabinet functions. Senator Gallagher. 
President, my question is also to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The Minister has just confirmed that legal advice has been sought from the Solicitor General to facilitate Attorney General Porter's return to the Cabinet. Why is it that the Prime Minister is willing to seek legal advice to ensure Mr Porter can return to work, but not to, to ensure Mr Porter is a fit and proper person to retain the role of, of Attorney General? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Advice is being sought in relation to ensuring that there are no uh, potential for any perceived conflicts of interest to exist. Uh, that's consistent uh, with many previous precedents in relation to management of conflicts of interest. The Minister has concluded his answer. Just avoided the order. Se um, Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. It is hard to justify, I must say. Um, the supplementary. Yesterday, the minister said in question time that as an, in, as an interim measure, until advice is received, the Attorney General's office will have no engagement with the federal court or the ABC. When will this advice be received? And given the Attorney General's defamation action could be appealed to the High Court, will that prohibition on engagement be extended? Senator Birmingham. Well, the, uh, the, sec the second part of the question uh, from Senator Gallagher uh, uh, obviously uh, depends upon the advice of the Solicitor General, uh, and the government will receive that advice, I'm sure, which will be provided as soon as the Solicitor General is in a position to provide it. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. The Morrison government has appointed a junior assistant minister to respond to the Respect at Work report after it sat on Mr Porter's desk for over a year prohibited the Attorney-General from engaging with the federal court and prohibited the Attorney-General from engaging with the ABC. Why is it Mr Morrison is willing to go to this extent to facilitate the Attorney-General's return to Cabinet when he's not even willing to read the complaint or seek legal advice? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Senator Stoker, since her appointment to the ministry, has been fulfilling duties that are allocated to assistant ministers in a range of different portfolios. Uh, this, was the, uh, this, was an appointment, this was an appointment of an assistant minister to the Attorney-General that had not previously existed, and quite appropriately, responsibilities were passed from the Attorney-General to Senator Stoker at the time. And indeed, she is pursuing further responses to the Respect at Work uh, inquiry, further responses to it, I add. Uh, because, indeed, the government has gotten on with a number of aspects of responding to the Respect at Work inquiry, and the $2.1 million provided to support and implement a number of recommendations, work to establish the Respect at Work Council, which was established and is due to meet for the first time this Friday, the establishment of the Respect at Work website as a central platform for resources on sexual harassment, Order, the conduct of a national Time survey on sexual harassment. Has expired. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, uh, Senator Soldier. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's technology, not taxes, approach to energy policy is creating new jobs, strengthening our economy, and reducing emissions? Order, order, set, order. I'm going to ask. I'm going. Order. I couldn't hear the second part of that question. I'm going to ask Senator McLaughlin to ask it again. Order. Senator McLaughlin, please thank you, ask thank your you, question Mr. President. again. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's technology, not taxes, approach to energy policy is creating new jobs, strengthening our economy and reducing admissions? I'm going to insist, Senator Wong, I'm going to insist on order during the question being asked so I can hear it for my own purposes. The minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator McLaughlin for uh, that outstanding question. The Morrison government is delivering on our plan to provide Australian families and businesses with the affordable and reliable power they need to help cement Senator our Ayers. economic recovery and to create jobs. And as I updated senators in February, we have delivered eight consecutive quarters of year-on-year -year CPI retail price reductions, and prices are set to continue to fall, continue to fall, putting Senator, more money in the hands Senator of Ayers. Australians 
more money Senator in the hands Ayers. of Australian households and Australian business. And I would think that those opposite should be welcoming uh, those falls in energy prices. But we're also reducing our emissions, uh, all the while reducing our emissions. And I know that senators will welcome the fact that Australia has reduced our emissions by 19 per cent on 2005 levels. And I would have thought Senator McAllister would welcome that fact. Would welcome the fact that we've reduced them by 19 per cent whilst lowering energy prices. I mean, why won't you join with us in celebrating with Australian families, in celebrating with Australian households? I mean, even Senator Watt would be welcoming that. Even the Greens should be welcoming Order our reduction. Order on Senators it McAllister and Gallagher. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. We should all be welcoming, and we are on track. We are on track. And when we compare our effort, our 19% reduction since 2005, Order. compared to New Zealand with 1%, 0.1% reduction in Canada, this is something we should all be celebrating because we have overachieved on our target by 639 million tonnes. Our emissions fell faster than Canada, New Zealand, Japan, United States, more than double the OECD average. So you can do this. You can deliver emissions reductions while delivering lower energy prices for Australian families, for Australian households, for Australian businesses. That's something we can all celebrate. That's something we can all get behind. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government is delivering reliable energy while meeting our international commitments? Senator Selger. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we are proud to be meeting and order, beating order. our Senator international Selger, commitments. Your, not, not an error on your part. There appears to be a problem with that microphone. Could you try and use the one adjacent to you, please? Um, there's a feedback coming from the microphone, so it might be easier. My apologies. Order. <laughs> Senator Seselja. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, and we are proud to be meeting and beating our international commitments without destroying jobs and without wrecking our economy as those opposite would do. And we know Labor would do it. We know the Greens would do it. I mean, the Greens, the Greens are out Order. there, you know, the un-Australian Greens Party arguing against our, our, our contribution, our, our nominee for the OECD, but we are getting it done. We are getting it done. We are actually doing it without a carbon tax. We are doing it through a technology, not taxes approach. And that is something that ensures we continue to support jobs. We continue to support household budgets. We continue to deliver on our emissions reductions target. We do it without a carbon tax. We do it by investing in technology. We do it by backing Australian business, by backing Australian innovation. That's our that's our policy. That's what we're going to continue to do, and it would be time for those opposite to start supporting those successful policies. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please advise why it is important to focus on delivering secure, reliable, and affordable energy for Australian families and businesses, and of any risks to this policy approach? Senator Seselja. Well, well, thank you, Senator McLaughlin, and uh, I thank him for the question. It is vital. It is absolutely vital that we focus on cheaper and more reliable energy because that is what Australians expect and that's what we are delivering. And Senator McAllister can interject all she likes uh, because, unfortunately, uh, there are risks, and it is from those opposite, Labor and the Greens, whose, whose only, only prescription when it comes to this area is more taxes. You know, leading the Labor Party's policy is the member for McMahon, uh, the member for McMahon who's never seen a tax that he didn't support, backed, of course, uh, by the Queensland Resources spokesman, Senator Murray Watt. Labor's car tax alone, of course, Labor's car tax alone would have added $3,000 to the cost Order. of a new vehicle. They, remember their retiree tax, the housing tax, the car tax, the carbon tax. Labor is all about taxes. This government is about technology, not taxes, lowering our emissions and Order, lowering Senator energy prices. Sosselja. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for uh, Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. After months of uncertainty for the half a million workers across our tourism sector, the government made a chaotic announcement of meagre support beyond the withdrawal of JobKeeper. In this chaotic announcement, the government has flagged a total cap of 800,000 uh, discounted tickets. Now that the government has been forced to expand the scheme due to, the, to uh, political pressure, 
Which of the 13 original locations will have their share of this support slashed? Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank Senator Farrell very much uh, for his question. I reject the premise of Senator Farrell's question because what Senator Farrell has failed to acknowledge is this important next step in the government's national economic recovery plan, which is about supporting businesses and workers and regions who are still finding it very difficult in the uh, post-COVID-19 pandemic period. And the packages mix of whether it is uh, discounted airline tickets, uh, loans for business, direct support to keep planes in the air, airline workers in their jobs is an important part of building that bridge to uh, back to a normal way of life for Australians. Now, the centrepiece of this package is a demand-driven program. It is, as the, as the senator said, 800,000 half-price airfares to actually enable Australians to travel, to actually support tourism operators and businesses and travel agents and airlines who have been dealing with these challenges. And I don't understand why those opposite do not support that initiative to actually engage with those businesses to actually enable those Australians to travel. So the package ultimately will take more tourists, whether it is to our hotels and our cafes, to go on tours, to explore our own backyard. And that does mean more jobs and investment for the tourism and aviation sectors. It is a win for local communities. The local communities that were spelt out here earlier in the week in the chamber don't understand why those opposite don't support those local communities and don't want to support them with this package, Mr President. The half-price ticket program, as we've said, initially operating to 13 key regions. And other new measures in the support package include that new international aviation support to assist Australia's international passenger airlines to maintain over 8,000 core international aviation jobs, support for regular passenger airports to meet their domestic security screening costs, a new aviation services assistance support program to support to help ground handling Order. companies Senator to meet Payne, the cost of mandatory training certification and accreditation. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Uh, I do have one. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. On Sunday, the Deputy Prime Minister on the ABC's Insiders uh, program couldn't answer a simple question about whether this program was capped or driven by actual demand and need. Can you please tell us what it is? <coughs> Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we've been quite quite clear about the about the 800,000 airfares, Mr. President. 800,000 airfares that will enable Australians to do that travelling that we've been talking about. That is about. Uh, motivating, incentivising, if you like, Australians to, uh, to travel around their own country. Order, and Senator we have Payne. Seen... I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Th thank thank you, demand. Mr President. Uh, the point of order is direct thank relevance. Uh, the question was very precise, and it was the same question the DPM could not answer. Is this program capped or demand-driven? I ask the minister to return to the question. Um, I let you restate the question, Senator Wong. I was listening very carefully, and unless I misheard, I thought I saw, heard a number referred to. I can't instruct a minister how to answer a question, um, so I'll call Senator Payne to continue. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, we know that there will be. I've mentioned the 800,000 figure, Mr. President. That is 800,000 half-price tickets to travel around Australia. An opportunity, Mr. President, which has, for example, seen flight searches on Virgin Australia increase order. almost 80% following the announcement of, of the. Uh, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Direct relevance. Didn't ask about booking system or. Travel agents asked a budget question. We asked a budget question, Mr. President, and I would ask you to remind the minister of the question. Um, I'm listening very carefully, Senator Wong. Um, I take the point that it was a question about a program. I and I heard earlier the minister refer to a number, but I can't instruct a minister how to, in the terms in which to answer a question. I've allowed you to reinforce the question. Um, but it is up to the minister to determine what terms in which she answers it. I'm listening very carefully, and at this point, I believe the minister is being directly relevant. Yeah. Senator Payne. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you for uh, for that ruling, uh, Mr. President. I was indicating what the impact of the announcement of 800,000 half-price airfares okay. and Senator, the associated. Order. Senator Payne, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Mr. President, I, I'm going to ask you to go away and reconsider that ruling after question time. Looking at the trans at the hand side. Uh, I again raise a point of order on direct relevance. The question, the question relates directly to whether this program has been funded as a capped program or a demand-driven program. I'm happy, Senator Wong, to take. I will always accept the re request of a senator to review the Hansard. My initial reaction is that when the minister is talking about a specific number, to ask me to go further and ask the minister to, when a specific. And, and, and Senator Wong, I'll take the interjection. That goes to, in my view, trying to instruct the minister of the terms of how to answer a question. There's an opportunity to debate it. I will reflect on this and come back to the chamber. Um, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I was saying, Mr. President, what we have seen in response to this measure is bookings increasing almost 40 per cent. Order, Flight Senator searches, Payne. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, Senator Farrell has the call. Senator Payne, Senator Farrell has the call for his final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do have a final supplementary question. Minister, how will the 800,000 tickets be distributed across the destination? Is there an agreement with the airlines and operators, or uh, is this again being decided by a colour-coded spreadsheet? Senator Payne. Well, Mr. President, I'm not sure that I understand the, the details of Senator Farrell's question, but this is demand driven about where passengers wish to go, where Australians want to travel. And as the Tourism Minister said uh, in uh, comments uh, uh, the day before yesterday, I think we are going to continue to work with the aviation sector. For example, if there are other destinations we need to add, we will do that. It is about giving people the confidence to travel, because if people have, to have the confidence to travel, we know that the demand and the will is there, and we know that they will take that up. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any uh, motions to oh, Minister? Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President, uh, for the information of the Senate, I table correspondence from the Chair of the Select Committee on COVID-19, Senator Gallagher, regarding the seven recommendations made by the committee in its second interim report. Deputy President, uh, in addressing, uh, in addressing uh, those recommendations and the response that I have in correspondence I've just tabled, at the outset I would like to restate some of the remarks made by Senators Patterson and Davey in their additional comments to the second interim report. It is important... Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Just stop the clock. Minister, thank yeah. you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. At the outset, I'd like to restate some of the remarks made by Senators Patterson and Senator Davey in their additional comments to the second interim report. It's important to note that the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 was appropriately established with bipartisan support on 8 April 2020, notably under the broadest possible terms of reference and with a tenure that effectively ensures it does not expire until the end of this term of parliament, if that is the wish of the committee. It is beyond doubt that both government and opposition parties acknowledge and respect the important role parliamentary oversight plays in our Westminster system of government, uh, as reflected by the establishment of this committee during the most extraordinary of times. To date, the committee has held over 40 public hearings, published over 500 submissions by interested organisations and individuals, and then it is published over 700 associated documents. It is noteworthy that in a time of health and economic crisis, officials from the Department of Health have appropriately appeared before the committee in public hearings no less than 10 times, and officials from the Department of the Treasury have appeared before the committee in public hearings 
no less than eight times to answer questions on how they and the government have responded to the dual health and economic crises. The committee has received nearly 2,000 answers to questions on notice throughout this period, nearly 2,000, overwhelmingly from government departments. A remarkable demonstration of cooperation and transparency, especially when considering they did so while managing the day-to-day -day fight against a once-in-a-generation global pandemic and associated economic crisis. They did so in addition to the work of those uh, departments responding also to other estimates questions on notice and other parliamentary questions on notice, which appear to have been no less frequent during that time. The relatively few disagreements between the committee and the government about a small number of public interest immunity claims should be viewed in the light of the overall significant cooperation and information sharing undertaken. In relation to the specific claims of public interest immunity, as noted in my correspondence to the chair of the committee, Senator Gallagher, the committee maintains the public interest immunity claims advanced in the initial responses to the committee's requests. The government holds the strong view that the documents and information sought would or could reasonably be expected to disclose the deliberations of the cabinet or a committee of the cabinet. Along with national security, this is the most long-standing and fundamental ground of a public interest immunity claim. As is well recognised in the Westminster system, it is in the public interest to preserve the confidentiality of cabinet deliberations to ensure the best possible decisions are made following thorough consideration and informed discussion of relevant proposals within cabinet. It is not in the public interest to disclose information about the cabinet's deliberations as it may impact in the future upon government's ability to receive confidential information and to make appropriately informed decisions impacting upon the Australian community. In keeping with this long-standing practice, information about the operation and business of the Cabinet and its committees, including when a matter went to the Cabinet, who attended and what form of submission was provided, as to do so could potentially reveal the deliberations of the Cabinet, which remain confidential for the reasons I have outlined. In relation to the request for legal advice, while I note that the Senate has not accepted legal professional privilege as a public interest immunity, it has been the long-standing practice of successive Australian governments not to disclose privileged legal advice. This practice has previously been outlined by the Honourable Gareth Evans QC in 1995, who said, nor is it the practice or has it been the practice over the years for any government to make available legal advice from its legal advisers made in the course of the normal decision-making process of government for good practical reasons associated with good government and also as a matter of fundamental principle. That was Senator Evans on the 28th of August, 1995. The Honourable Philip Ruddock stated in 2004 on the 29th of March, Order. it is not the practice of the attorney to comment on matters of legal advice to the government. Any advice given, if it is given, is given to the government. Former Senator, the Honourable Joe Ludwig on the 26th of May, 2011, put the position as follows. To the extent that we are now going to the content of the advice, can I say that it has been a long-standing practice of both this government and successive governments not to disclose the content of advice. The government maintains, consistent with the positions put by ministers uh, of previous governments uh, of both Labor and coalition persuasion, that it is not in the public interest to depart from this established position. It is integral that privileged legal advice provided to the Commonwealth remains confidential. Access by government to such confidential advice is, in practical terms, essential to the development of sound Commonwealth policy and robust lawmaking. The specific harm that the doctrine of legal professional privilege seeks to prevent is the harm to the administration of justice that would result from the disclosure of confidential interactions between lawyer and client. Both the High Court of Australia and the Federal Court of Australia have confirmed that legal professional privilege promotes the public interest by enhancing the administration of justice, facilitating freedom of consultation 
and encouraging full and frank disclosure between clients and their advisers. I thank the Senate for the opportunity uh, to respond and comment uh, on the matters tabled in the letter to Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rustin. Madam Deputy President, um, I refer uh, to the comments made um, by the Leader of the Government uh, in the Senate today and the correspondence that I sent to the Chair of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 data the 18th of December 2020. I confirm the Government maintains a public interest immunity claim over the content of the advice that was provided in the context of the Cabinet deliberations. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also refer to the comments made today by the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the correspondence from the Attorney-General to the Chair of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 dated 14 May 2020 and 11 June 2020 and confirm the Government maintains its public interest immunity claim uh, over the content of the confidential legal advice in question. Thank you. Um, Minister. Minister Colbeck. Thank you, Deputy President. I refer to the comments made by the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the correspondence from the Health Minister to the Chair of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 dated the 23rd of September 2020 and the 1st of October 2020 and confirm that the Government maintains its public interest immunity claim over the confidential Cabinet doc deliberations in question. Thank you, Minister. Thank Senator you, Gallagher, Madam you Deputy President. Note? I move that the Senate take note of the statement made by the ministers uh, in relation to uh, the COVID-19 Select Committee and the public interest immunity claims. What the Senate has just witnessed is uh, four ministers coming into this chamber and giving the proverbial finger to non-executive members of this place. That's what's just happened. Make no mistake. There was a lot of words expressed by the Leader of the Government in the Senate, but it was a lot of words to try to justify the unjustifiable. Now, let me be clear. The Senate committee has worked well and we have worked hard. Senator Birmingham made those points. But we have been thorough as well. And when we have had public servants refuse to provide information and hope that we'll just forget about it, we didn't. We wrote to those heads of department and we said, you took this on notice, you haven't replied. They then referred it to ministers and eventually, months later, often, we got a response from ministers with a lazy use of the public interest immunity claim, often not even specifying the nature of the harm that would be caused to the public by, not pro by providing that information to the committee. Some of them didn't even, uh, well, most of them didn't even abide by the Cormann motion um, of 2009, which clearly sets out the way for public servants and ministers to work through that process. And what we did then was we considered the claim. On two of them, we agreed with the government. On the others, we didn't. And we brought that to this chamber and we won the vote. Every non-government senator in this place considered the matter, as we were, are required to do and as um, Harry Evans specified in his note in 2005, that when that matter arises in a committee, to bring it back and report it to the Senate. And that is what we did. And the Senate voted to order the government to provide those, that information or, in the absence of doing that, make a statement exactly about why they aren't going to provide that information, and I'll, I'll come to that. But just so people understand, because it's a broader principle here, yes, we are after the information. We are after information that I didn't even think would ever be refused by the government. The date the Cabinet first got briefed about the pandemic. Whoa. Pretty relevant to the work that the COVID committee was actually set up to do, which is to monitor the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So you would think, actually, when, when you first got briefed, when the, the chief medical officer uh, first provided information to, to the uh, cabinet, when the minister for aged care with a, with a COVID um, crisis raging through aged care that he was responsible for, for facilities, for hundreds of people dying, when did he first brief the Cabinet? Was it in May? Was it in June? Was it in July? Not what did he brief the Cabinet, but when did he brief it? 
We didn't ask about cabinet deliberations. We never ever sought information that related to, to the ongoing um, discussions within um, cabinet. We accept that. But dates, come on. How are we meant to fulfil our job if the government, in a very stubborn way, once they'd taken the decision not to provide that, finds them in this position where we've won an order for production of documents some six months after the question's been asked, and you're still saying it relates to cabinet deliberations? It's ridiculous. I mean, these the claims and the, the the information sought is not unreasonable. It should have been provided at the time. For example, the date on which the AHPPC, a body that the um, government often tosses out as being the most important body that's been assisting them with the pandemic, when did they brief the Minister for Health first? When did they go to Cabinet first? When did they brief the National Cabinet? I mean, the Productivity Commission chair gave a presentation to National Cabinet, so it's gone to all of those governments. Could we have a copy of the presentation, please? No. No, top secret. Not allowed to have it. So every other governments are allowed to have it. What they do with it is up to them. They've all got the presentation, but we're not allowed the PowerPoint. It's ridiculous. Some of the decisions about the economic support, well, no, some of the um, information about the economic support packages about the, you know, the information that went into determining that that was the package, not, whether, not what were the options before you made the decisions about the package, but what were the expectations of what that package would deliver. You know? No, nope, not allowed any of that information. And our terms of reference are very simple. It's to um, monitor the Australian government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. All of these relate to the health and economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And yes, we have got a lot of information out of um, the public service. Sometimes it's painful, but we have got it. Sometimes it's clear they don't want to answer, probably because they're worried about whether they get in trouble or not. But we persist and we tell them, you're not allowed to just say nothing or refuse to answer. We, give them, we explain to them. But that is part of their job. You know, Senator Birmingham says, well, they've come to all these hearings and they've provided all this information. Yes, because they're accountable to this chamber as well as working for executive government. You know, it's not an option. It's part of their job to support the work of Senate committees. They may not see it that way. And under this government, I think it has changed a little about their interaction with Senate committees, but it is part of their job. It is not an option about whether or not they want to participate. So yes, I appreciate the fact that they have come to the committee, but I don't think it's out of charity or that we should feel honoured that they have come. And I've explained that to them before, that it is part of their job. Now, when I go and read the advice of that great Harry Evans, where he is clear about the grounds for uh, claiming public interest immunity in his note and what the Senate has accepted as being legitimate or potentially acceptable grounds, and they are listed. And he also goes to those um, grounds that haven't been accepted by the Senate as reasons to withhold information, and they are advice to government. And quite often we have witnesses coming here and going, uh, and we ask about um, whether they provided advice, and they, they might not even want to answer that question, let alone um, because they just say, oh, it's advice to government, it's, you, you can't have it. No, the Senate has never accepted that. Legal professional privilege, the Senate has never accepted that. Yep. Cabinet in confidence, the Senate has never accepted that. And they are all the reasons that this government is using to withhold this information. The Senate has never accepted that. We have accepted that disclosing information that relates to the deliberations of Cabinet are, and we are not trying to change that. But just because you've stamped Cabinet in confidence, or it might have been walked through on a trolley along with the sandwiches and cups of tea, doesn't mean that that information is withheld 
in a COVID safe way, of course, um, does not mean that that information should be withheld from the Senate. And the, the thing here is, I mean, Senator Birmingham has a very polite style, but his, what he has done today is to say to every non-executive member of this place, whatever you ask for and on whatever terms you ask for it, we are the, the ones who decide and we decide that the Senate is not having it. So whilst they're trying to get through the IR bill and do deals with um, crossbench members, think about this because they're trying to be all nice to you on one side, but you said the other day you wanted this information and they have come in here and said bad luck. Yep. That's what they've said. And that's what this government is known for, secrecy, double speak, withholding information when it's polit politically inconvenient to release it. Yep. That is what this is about. And so maybe we won't get this information, even though the committee wants it and the Senate has actually asked the government to provide it. Maybe we won't. But the principle here is that we don't accept the lazy and misuse of the public interest immunity claims process. We don't accept it. The Senate should not accept it. We do think this information should be provided. And this is a principle that the Senate should stay firm on. Because if we let this one through, what next, Senators? What next? You know? because I think anything becomes possible then. If we don't stand up and push back on this today and have some consequence for this, what next? Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Seaworth. Thank you, Biddy President. I'm a part of the committee. I'm a member of the COVID committee and am absolutely appalled that the government hides behind public interest immunity. But I'll also remind the chamber that it's not the first time that this has happened in very recent history, and we don't have to go far back to, to work out and to think about when it occurred. Robo-debt, repeatedly, repeatedly used there uh, and refused to provide the Community Affairs Committee with the information that we were very justified in asking about their uh, decision making and how they came to decisions around robo-debt. I'm using that as an example, not to uh, prosecute that argument yet again, but the fact that this government keeps hiding behind the cabinet in confidence arguments again and again. Cabinet when they, as Senator Gallagher's just said, wheeling a trolley through the cabinet with some documents piled high on anything that the Senate might ask for is not appropriate. So this isn't the first time the government is hiding behind cabinet incompetence or public interest immunity. Now, I'd argue very strongly that there is not an argument of cabinet incompetence for telling us, and one of the questions that they refused to answer was about how did they determine the coronavirus supplement rate? How did they determine it? Wouldn't you think that was in the public interest to know? And I tell you what, I'm really interested to know because it's very important for the debate that we'll have later in this chamber, probably tomorrow, rush through when we no doubt get a motion on ours, where they'll then, of course, include the guillotine and to gag debate on the debate over the government's appalling rate of job seeker, which is in the legislation that will come before this chamber to be just $25 a week, when the coronavirus supplement was doubled, a move that this Senate supported and agreed with because the government knew that people couldn't survive on $40 a day. So we wanted to know, quite justifiably, because it was a COVID response, how they came up, how was that rate determined? No, nah, won't tell us. We also asked for the modelling 
on the job seeker payment. No, nah, won't tell us. We asked for the modelling around stage two tax cuts being forward. No, nope, won't tell us. When was Cabinet first briefed by the Chief Medical Officer? An absolutely fundamental question. No, secret, we won't tell you. So you have to ask, what have they got to hide? It's a really simple question that Australia has the right to know. Why not tell us? We also asked, when did the Minister for Aged Care, Minister Colbeck, brief Cabinet on the aged care issues that we also plainly saw roll out it in this country? No, nah, won't tell you. Wouldn't tell us. We also asked how often the Minister for Aged Care briefed Cabinet on the crisis, aged care crisis, and not one person could deny that we had a crisis here. Did he tell us? No. Apparently that's secret too. That's secret. How many times did he? Did he recognise? When did he recognise that we had a crisis on our hands? When did the government know that Australia had a crisis on its hand in aged care? We don't know because he won't tell us. He wouldn't tell us. The government won't tell us? Oh, that's right, it's cabinet in confidence. How often did he brief? When did he brief? When did he attend cabinet? When did the government know? And how urgently then? It tells us how urgently and when they started responding to the aged care crisis. No, won't tell you. We also asked about childcare. We all know that there was amendments made to payments and how we approach childcare during, during the crisis, during the heat of the crisis last year. Wouldn't, won't provide the modelling on when they then changed their mind and ended that particular approach. Won't provide that. Won't provide the, won't provide the parameters on JobKeeper. Won't provide the information on when Cabinet decided that Australia was going for a suppression approach rather than an elimination approach to COVID. These are all questions that are very legitimate questions for the COVID committee, part of our work. The committee was charged by this place to do this work, won't provide that information. They are key bits of information for the committee to do our work, but not only just for us to do our work, it's for broader Australia to know. But I know it's Cabinet in confidence. As has been discussed in this chamber before, we don't accept those claims. This information is information the committee should have access to, and it's information Australia should have access to. And I'll go back to the issues around the coronavirus supplement. Those were important decisions the government made, very important decisions. And they are happy to take the support and the welcoming of that from the, from the Australian community but they're not happy to tell us how they came to that rate. That is appalling. Australia has a right to know how we decided on that rate because it's made a lot of difference to Australians having had access when they were unemployed, having had access to that rate. So I'd argue very strongly, and I do argue very strongly, that we have a right to know how that rate was arrived at because it is so important and because it was so important. But of course the government doesn't want to release that because it makes even more of it, they know it'll make a mockery of the lousy 25 bucks a week, $3.57. I'd challenge people to find out where you could buy a coffee, cup of coffee in this country for $3.57. Okay. It makes an absolute mockery of the rate that you are going to ask this place to pass 
probably within 24, maybe a bit longer, depending if we get an hour's motion, 36 hours. This information is important to this country and it should be made available. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to uh, take note of the, the minister's response. Um, I accept uh, the, what the uh, Finance Minister has said in relation to the uh, COVID committee being set up as, uh, uh, under, uh, with bipartisan support. Uh, and that's a good thing. But of course, in order for a committee to do its work, it has to be properly informed. It needs to be able to have access to information. So you can't stand and say, it's OK, we've, we've, um, uh, we've assisted, we've given our support to a committee, uh, but then on the other hand, deny relevant information to its line of inquiry. I want to go to two claims that have been made by the government. The first goes to legal professional privilege. Now, uh, it's worthwhile understanding the purpose of the privilege. The purpose of the privilege allows for confidential discussions between a client and a, and, uh, a, a lawyer. In this case, the lawyer will be either the Solicitor General or the AGS or perhaps a contracted lawyer, but the client is, of course, the Commonwealth Government. And one of the things that uh, you can do in relation to legal professional privilege when you are the client, because the privilege belongs to you, is you can simply waive the privilege. You can say, uh, I, I accept that uh, this is legal advice, uh, but it, it, the, the release of this information will not cause harm, so I waive my privilege. That's the first thing that the government could do in these circumstances. Have a look at what the content of the legal advice is and in the spirit of openness and transparency, simply waive the privilege. Now, I know people stand up on a regular basis and say that that, is, uh, that, that undermines the uh, well-established doctrine. Well, the bottom line is it does not. The doctrine permits the waiving of privilege. The client just simply has to say, I uh, agree to waive the privilege. And I might point out that on the 2nd of March 1986, uh, the, the, uh, cabinet, uh, the Cabinet made a decision uh, under the uh, Secretary of the, Brazil, uh, of the uh, Attorney General's Department at the, to uh, at the time, Mr Brazil. It's called the Brazil Direction. And it was a direction from Cabinet that, in actual fact, uh, Legal advice belongs to the government, paid for by the people, and only in circumstances where harm uh, could be caused, it should be released. So I invite people to go and have a look at the Brazil direction and uh, study it, and you'll see that there's no reason, unless there is harm caused, uh, as to why legal uh, advice can't simply be handed over. Now, the minister did not stand up and say, this is the harm that would be caused by a particular piece of advice being given. He didn't do that. He simply said it would be harmful just because we do it. That would cause the harm. That's wrong. That's simply wrong, uh, I say to Minister Birmingham. And you need to, I think you should go away and reflect on that. The second part of the, the equation, if you don't wish to waive privilege, is that the, uh, the Senate has the power to uh, order the production of, uh, of legal advice. I said earlier in this chamber on Monday, I said, I read out from the judgment of Egan and Chadwick in the New South Wales Supreme Court, where unanimously the, the Supreme Court uh, appeals justices uh, basically said that uh, the, the uh, Legislative Council, the New South Wales Legislative Council, has the power to order uh, the production of legal advice uh, in circumstances where they believe it belo that. Uh, it uh, relates to the work that they carry out uh, as a legislature, either in respect of uh, uh, considering legislation or in its oversight role. So there is no reason why the government should not hand over that advice. It is consistent with uh, the doctrine of legal privilege and it is consistent with the rule of law in this country. Please don't stand up and say, an attorney general said this, therefore it is. Why don't you listen to the justices 
within our legal system who I think are much better qualified than uh, people in this chamber to understand what the law of this land is. And it would be good if the government complied with the law of this land, and unfortunately they are not. Now, in relation to the second aspect of some of the claims, the, the claim of uh, cabinet inconfident, uh, inconfidence, again, we should go and look back at the root purpose of uh, cabinet inconfidence. The dominant purpose of that protection is to protect the deliberations of cabinet. That is the exchange of, uh, of words between ministers across the cabinet table for the, uh, for the protection of what is referred to as collective responsibility. We allow ministers to have their, their, uh, their uh, uh, opinions, to uh, say what they want to say about whatever is being talked about in cabinet. But the guiding principle is there is collective responsibility. Once you walk out of the cabinet room, you adopt the uh, position of the cabinet. And uh, there is a protection around deliberation of, of cabinet. But there's also a, uh, a ruling, uh, again, in the, in the civil jurisdiction, that, that, uh, that deliberations are strictly, are strictly the discussions that take place between ministers uh, around the cabinet table. And uh, the cabinet rules, and I've got, looked into this in, in great detail, the cabinet rules uh, do not permit the deliberations of cabinet to be recorded on the minutes of, of, of cabinet. They can only be recorded by the note takers who then take the notebooks and they lock them up, send them to the archives and we, we find out later what has been said. It is not possible for any minute from the cabinet any decision of the cabinet to contain a deliberation because that's not permitted under our cabinet rules. So uh, a claim that we see quite regularly thrown around, and, and actually I've got some challenges in the, with the Information Commissioner in relation to some of these, uh, these cavalier claims, that, uh, that uh, you know, these are deliberations of cabinet, are simply false because the only place deliberations of cabinet call, uh, are recorded are in the notebooks. Uh, of course, there, there is accepted uh, principles behind the, uh, uh, the keeping secret of cabinet uh, decisions and cabinet minutes. But again, understand what the law of this land is. I invite you, invite you to go and have a look at the case of Sankey and Whitlam uh, in the High Court, where the High Court determined it is not for the Cabinet to decide whether or not to keep uh, Cabinet documents secret in, in, uh, in court proceedings. It is a matter for the court to do so. No one in this country is, is uh, immune from handing over uh, documents uh, or, or entitled to complete secrecy. If the interests of justice demand or require the adducing of Cabinet documents, then the High Court has said that is what will happen. Brett Walker SC, and I know the attorney respects uh, uh, Brett Walker SC, he's engaged him in, in, his, in, in his, uh, uh, his, his uh, matter uh, that he's uh, just initiated, uh, gave a presentation here a couple of years ago that said the High Court has said that uh, Cabinet documents can be adduced in a court if the burden has been met, uh, the interests of justice demand it. He also indicated that that is the same uh, sort of threshold test uh, can be applied and that, the, uh, that, that uh, the Senate has the ability to demand those documents as well. So the, 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 one of the problems we've got here is that, um, is that the government is simply very cavalier in all of its, in all, all of its claims. I have uh, brought into this chamber uh, on at least one occasion and certainly to, to a committee room, a document that is cabinet in confidence according to a response to an order for production that I got under FOI. You make the claims in such a ca cavalier manner that get overturned. My current score, it's gone up since the last time I spoke in the, in the, uh, in the chamber about this, current st score on FOI appeals is, uh, is Rec 7, Governments 0 gone up by one. Because you make all these claims and they are not properly grounded in law and they get overturned. And what happens is everyone understands now what you're doing. You're crying wolf. 
You, cr you cry wolf every time someone wants, to, wants a piece of information. You inappropriately and unlawfully uh, withhold that document. Again, I say that uh, uh, transparency to the Prime Minister is like kryptonite to Superman. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So the question is, the motion to take note is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, we'll now move to taking note. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Colbeck and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Dodson and O'Neill. I wish to uh, talk about the vaccine rollout because it, it's, there's a lot of concern in the community and that concern is centred around a number of issues that have been badly handled with the vaccine rollout by this government. We've had issues around uh, overdosing, we've had issues around training, we've had issues around uh, storage, we've had uh, issues, as I uh, understand it, even today with the launch of the booking system. And it's really, unfortunately, seems to be par for the course for this government. It's a confused, slow and an uneven rollout of the COVID vaccination program. Across Australia and in my, own, in my home state of Tasmania, now, I think everyone would remember when the Prime Minister promised that four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March, end of March this year. And of course, we know that we're, I think we're about over 160,000, but a long way off, for, for, a long way off the four million. And of course, Senator Colbeck and his response to Senator Dodson did not respond at all to the question that was asked of him about the Prime Minister's um, commitment to Australia around vaccinations. And then, of course, that commitment did morph in, um, to be completely fair to the Prime Minister, it did morph in um, that the commitment of four million would be by the end of April. And then, of course, that commitment disappeared altogether. There have been commitments to six million vaccinations by the, by the 10th of May and even 11 million by the end of May. Well, if the rollout in Tasmania is anything to go by, the government is a long, long way from delivering on these commitments. The problem is that despite months of planning, the systems to deliver the vaccine programs are still not in place. I just want to go to the announcement that was made today and have a look at the electorate of Lyons. Now, in Tasmania, there have been 36 GP clinics announced, and in the electorate of Lyons, there's only five. Now, Lyons contains 12 municipalities and six of them six of them have been left off the vaccination map now the government expects people living in the Derwent Valley Southern Midlands Glamorgan Spring Bay Tasman the Central Highlands and Kentish to travel and are now expected to travel considerable distances to get vaccinated and that's if they can of course get an appointment and if the GP clinic has any available vaccine but of course, I've already spoken about booking through the national booking system because we've already heard the issues around the system not standing up. There has been some website errors. Now, I hope that the system stands up to the demand and doesn't suffer from the same fate as many of the other platforms that this government had. Uh, this government has uh, run in the past because they don't have a very good track record. But I hope it does stand up, despite the early um, reportings this afternoon, because it simply would not be good enough for this, the booking system to not be able to handle 
handle um, the demand. Now, for the older people living on the Ta Tasman Peninsula and on the east coast, their nearest GP clinics are in Sorrell and St Helens, which are 90 minutes away. The government has really done a very bad job with the vaccinations. They've overpromised, overcommitted, substantially overpromised and overcommitted. They, they have had one issue after another. As I said, they've had the overdosing, they've had the lack of training. They really need to get their act together because uh, oh, people you, are Senator relying Brown. on this Your vaccination program. Expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, here we go again, every single day. Whatever it is, there can be never any recognition from those opposite that Australia has weathered the COVID pandemic better than all major advanced nations, both in economic and health terms. And it doesn't matter where we're talking, doesn't matter if we're looking at the $267 billion that's gone direct in, health, in economic and health support to Australians. We can't talk about the $267 billion that has benefited Australians through this pandemic without hearing doom and gloom from those opposite. And as everyone around the world has experienced when their vaccine programs have launched, it's been slow and steady as the vaccine rollout starts up. That's the sensible medical-based approach that's been taken around the world. But yet again, Labor Party have to come in on all their complaints, all their worries, all their concerns, which we know is part of their generalised faux outrage about everything. But one moment they're calling for it to be rolled out as fast as possible, the next they're calling out cries around safety. We couldn't have consistency of message. We couldn't have anything that doesn't absolutely look like hypocrisy. I mean, we've seen it this week. The Women for, Women for Justice March, where we saw Tanya Plibersek and Senator Waters, Senator Waters being shuttered away by Tanya Plibersek as Cathy Sheriff tried to address the march. But no, 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 we, we only want to focus on one side as we politicise this issue. And yet again, this hypocrisy is coming through because one minute the vaccine's not happening fast enough, the next minute we're not sure how safe it's going to be. We need to make sure those in aged care have more surety and we're not sure about each different type of vaccine. But yet again, the hypocrisy comes through. You know, I think you'd actually have a much better time just on a general day-to-day -day basis if you just ease back on the anger about everything. The faux outrage must be exhausting. I mean, you really must be tired, and I do feel sorry for you all. And, you know, all of these Australians, 164,000 that have received vaccines at the moment, but the other side of this is that we have ensured in the Morrison government that we have sovereignty over vaccines, that we're able to produce our own vaccines and have sovereignty. We will not be beholden to exports from the world once we establish the production means which we have organised to happen for the AstraZeneca vaccine to be delivered in a sovereign way to Australians. This domestic production will start with one million per week of deliveries from late March. But no, not good enough over here. Going to have to get a little outrage up there. Probably don't like advanced manufacturing very much either, or probably not too happy about job creation happening in this country. You know, we heard today how JobKeeper, that was absolutely stated by opposition leader Albanese that it should be tapered out. I mean, he's obviously a little distracted this week while he's trying to ignore a Facebook chat group. But, you know, he was the one advocating for JobKeeper to be tapered out, but now, no, 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 we've changed our mind again. We've changed our mind again because living wages, handouts, subsidisation of industry is all part of your mantra. We want Australians to get back to normal life. We want pre-COVID existence to come back. We want Australians to have security in not only their own businesses but in their jobs. And that's going to happen through the vaccine. I'm sure you guys won't be lining up for it as you object to every step of it the way, but I'm sure in more hypocrisy you'll probably come through because you know, you'll be advocating confidence or whatever you're looking for as you criticise the rollout, as you criticise the safety. 
No, I'm sure you, you, you guys will... You won't want to get the vaccine at one moment, then you'll want to get it the next, because you guys don't know which way's up, whether it's black or whether it's white. No, you guys Order. have had your say over there about Order. one minute it's not fast enough, the next minute it's not safe. The next Order. minute we're criticising that Europe won't send it over, but we're not happy about domestic production. We're not happy about creating jobs and keeping it on shore. We're not happy about securing our sovereignty. You guys just are never happy. I really think you need to get out, give yourself a big pat on the back at each other and let yourselves know it's OK to smile. It's OK to be happy about the way Australia's performed through the pandemic. It's OK, guys. Thank you, Senator Holly. Your uh, Senator, beg your pardon, Senator Hughes. Your time has expired. Senator Chisholm. Inject a dose of reality into this debate because it was sadly lacking from that performance there. And I won't dwell too much on it because it was a bit of an alternative universe that Senator Hughes tried to create there. So I won't dwell on it too much. But suffice to say, if any of those Australians out there on JobKeeper saw that performance, I would sure they would be absolutely aghast that that is what the coalition senators are talking about in this important debate. So you can make things up and you can throw all sorts of accusations, but what we saw today in question time is actually the collision of incompetence and neglect from this government. Because that's actually the questions that we put about JobKeeper and the vaccine actually go to the collision of neglect and competence of this government. And the neglect is focused on those hundreds of thousands of Australians that are going to be losing their job uh, in 11 days when they cut JobKeeper. That goes to the neglect of this government. The fact that they are prepared to sit back and basically ignore those people and let them fall onto the scrap heap um, because uh, they are not focused on those people. And then we see the incompetence. And this is the dangerous part because the incompetence is going to have consequences. It goes to the vaccine. And we are angry about the vaccine, but that's because they promised 4 million would be done by March. And we're not going to get anywhere near that. And we're also angry because their incompetence on policy solutions is going to ensure those who rely on tourism are going to be worse off as well, which is going to make them cutting JobKeeper worse. So they try and say they've got solutions to these problems, but none of them are actually going to work. The vaccine is slow. Their policy prescriptions around tourism are diabolical and aren't actually going to fix that problem. So they can't put a policy solution in place. Um, they can't get the vaccines delivered on time and they are showing neglect for those Australians who are going to be cut off JobKeeper shortly. And that is a significant impact in Queensland. And what we saw is a level of arrogance from this government when the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, travelled to Cairns uh, and Senator Green was there waiting for him. And he had no policy solution. He had no detail that he was going to do uh, to roll out for the tourism industry. And there's 172,000 Queenslanders who rely on JobKeeper and they are going to lose their payments in 11 days. That will actually cut $83 million a week from Queensland's economy. We can't afford to fall off a cliff when this ends. Uh, international borders remain closed and we know the reason why. Uh, but the slow pace of the vaccine rollout is actually going to ensure that those international borders are closed for longer. And what's been estimated across Australia is that 100,000 people will lose their job. We understand that a quarter of Queensland's 40,000 tourism businesses have predicted they will go bust when JobKeeper ends. So the government is acting too quick to remove JobKeeper and it is too slow on the vaccine rollout. And there is a level of incompetence when it comes to this. Currently, there are around 203,000 Australians who've been given doses. The Prime Minister promised there would be 4 million doses administered by the end of March. According to the news reports, we are 2.1 million doses below the required level to meet that 4 million target. Bloomberg has a list of all countries currently vaccinating, and Australia is currently 68 out of, out of the number of doses administered behind Rwanda, Panama and Bulgaria, amongst many others. So when you look at the doses per 100 people, Australia is tracking significantly below South Korea, the EU, US and the UK when they were at the same stage of their vaccine rollout. 
And there's also been media reports about the impact of this in regional Queensland, uh, where there are uh, doctors' groups who have said that they are only going to get 100,000 doses each week when they have 20,000 patients. So it is not going to do the job of those who need it the most. And I've mentioned the incompetence on policy as well. So the flights announcement has been a debacle from start to finish. Uh, we saw the Deputy Prime Minister in the media last Sunday unable to answer questions. They've had a few days to actually get their answer right on this. And again, we saw the minister representing in question time not actually provide that answer. So there's no wonder that Australians are anxious about this government and their decisions. Uh, it is a mixture of incompetence uh, and it is also a, a dose of neglect. And it is the Australian people that are being worse off, unfortunately, because of their decisions that they are making uh, with the ending of JobKeeper, that is going to have a devastating impact for many Australians. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And just as Australians are again confident that the future is bright, our best days in fact lie ahead, just as confidence returns to the Australian economy and just as we get assurance that uh, with the delivery of the vaccine we will move to a post-COVID world, those opposites seek to undermine confidence in both the vaccine rollout and the strength of the Australian economic comeback, which is so clearly on. In December, Consumption was up 4.3 per cent and business investment up 2.6 per cent, its strongest result since 2017. Dwelling investment, driven by the government's successful uh, home builder package, up 4.1 per cent, its strongest quarterly increase since 2015. Madam Deputy President, we're not done yet. Also in the December quarter, direct economic support from the federal government was halved. That is half the amount of borrowed taxpayer money being injected into the economy, and yet at the same time, the economy grew by 3.1 per cent. The second such quarter, where we achieved economic growth of more than 3 per cent in a quarter since 1959. The first time since 1959 we've achieved two such quarters at that level of growth. One, sorry, 2.1 million Australians graduated off the JobKeeper program, and that's because this government stands for Australian business and a prosperous economy, allowing Australians to go about their business and do what they do best. Those opposite seek to undermine both the economic comeback and confidence in our vaccine rollout at such a critical time. Madam Deputy President, spare me the feigned indignation over there. The JobKeeper program was always as with everything that this government has done to simulate the economy and shepherd it through the global pandemic, it was always targeted, time-limited and never intended to be permanent. Initially, the JobKeeper program was only planned for six months. And indeed, as we've heard today, the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, said there would always need to be a taper. But instead, this government extended it for 12 months. 12 months and at a cost of $90 billion being the single largest economic support program of any government since this nation was federated. Uh, 2.7 million Australians have already had their jobs protected by the JobKeeper program, but then uh, graduated from that program and make their way in the world uh, unabated. That is what this government's track record says. 100,000 new apprentices in the first five months of our successful job maker hiring credit. But we weren't done yet. As we've heard Minister Cash and the Prime Minister announce in recent days, we've expanded that program. This government is about jobs, lives and livelihoods. We have been unashamed about that. Uh, with respect to the vaccine uh, rollout, I'm, I'm pleased to advise the Senate that there are now more than 203,000 vaccines that have been administered. That is a 10 per cent increase on the number of uh, vaccinations delivered in Australia since yesterday. More than 10 per cent increase in the last 24 hours. 509 aged care facilities and more than 45,000 of our most vulnerable Australians in aged care have received those vaccinations. And that's despite the fact that we've only received 700,000 of our contracted 3.8 million AstraZeneca vaccines. Why? Because this government was the government that made the decision in August last year to ensure we had sovereign vaccine manufacturing capability so that those countries that still find themselves in the depths of this crisis 
Madam Deputy President, like the UK, like the US, like countries in Europe, where tens of thousands of people die every day, Australia finds ourselves with the capability to manufacture a vaccine right here in our own back door. The rollout continues as we have said it would, because this government was clear that in February we would commence phase 1A. When did we do that? February 22. The AstraZeneca program was always uh, scheduled to commence in March, and lo and behold, we find ourselves about to commence phase 1B uh, with uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, four weeks after the commencement of 1A. Already more than 1,000 general practices across this nation uh, are ready to administer that vaccine, and we're increasing the capability of the uh, vaccine program by another 4,000 general practices over coming weeks. Rural and regional Australians have been considered, uh, with the phases not applying in those isolated communities such that travel is not a problem. This government is about lives and livelihoods. Thank you, Madam Thank President. Thank you, uh, Senator Small. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. It's interesting to hear the government talk about confidence because in Cairns there is no confidence in this government. We know that the member for Leichhardt sits in the government party room. We know that the treasurer visited Cairns. The minister for tourism has visited Cairns. So maybe those three men would like to have a quiet word with the senators opposite and the members of the government party room because there is no confidence in Cairns. And when they come in here and talk about how great everything is going, it shows how out of touch they are with the reality, with the, uh, what people are facing in far north Queensland right now. People in far north Queensland are listening to the words in this place. They have heard that the government promised four million vaccines by the end of March. They also heard that, that we would be fully vaccinated by the end of October. Well, it took two questions from Senator Gallagher over here the other day to find out that we will not be fully vaccinated in October. And why does that matter? Why does it matter that the government made promises and they're not going to meet them? Nobody forced them to make these promises. Nobody forced them to make these commitments. Why does it matter? Well, the government has also said that international travel will return in October in line with the vaccination program. So there are people in my community who are listening to the promises the government is making about delivering four million vaccines, about making sure that all Australians are fully vaccinated by October and they are planning their financial security, their economic security around these promises. That's why it matters. In 11 days, 8,000 workers in Cairns will lose JobKeeper. Cairns has the highest number of JobKeeper recipients of any postcode outside the big cities and their suburbs. And I've heard the arguments opposite today that from the ministers answering questions that JobKeeper was always supposed to be temporary and targeted. Well, in terms of targeting, wouldn't you think that targeting JobKeeper and extending JobKeeper to one of the hardest hit communities in our country would be a good thing for this government to do? Absolutely it is, but they are not doing that. Instead, they've come up with some haphazard scheme, a scheme that they don't even have the details on yet. They haven't actually decided whether it's a cap, whether it's demand, what destinations will be on that list. The, the program to take the place of JobKeeper isn't even thought out, and yet JobKeeper will be cut in 11 days. What operators are saying, though, and I've, we've heard a lot from those opposite about what Labor is saying, but the operators, the tourism operators in Cairns, have made many comments since the Morrison government made its so-called aviation announcement and in the lead-up to JobKeeper. Tony Baker, the managing director of Quicksilver, said that continued government support was needed to survive. Anything that encourages visitors is great, he said, but we still need some form of ongoing wage subsidy. 
On the federal government's aviation package, Perry Jones from Ocean Free sums up the concerns that many have. He said, on the 1st of April, if there is no one on that boat, there's no wages coming in. And of the half price flight scheme, he said that the only problem is that it doesn't mean they're going to be on my boat. This is what these two tourism operators are saying publicly. What they are saying publicly, privately is that they have been left behind by this government, that they have no confidence in this government to deliver the vaccina vaccination rollout in the timeline that they promised. No one forced them to make those promises, but they can't even live up to those. They are saying privately that they are terrified. They are going to lose their jobs. They are going to lose their businesses. It is a major concern for people who have uh, listened to what this government has said, the promises on vaccinations, four million vaccinations by the end of March, fully vaccinated by the end of October, that this government is not delivering Thank on you, its Senator promise. Green, your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Brown to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the minister's answer to my question on Aboriginal deaths in custody. So which minister? Sorry, Senator uh, Thorpe. Ms. Minister Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham. Mr. Birmingham. Thank you. Calling what the minister gave an answer is a bit rich because it was not an answer at all. It was more platitudes and motherhood statements about how they care about ending Aboriginal deaths in custody, how they are taking action and how they are taking them seriously, inverted commons. And then they say that they are sorry and that it's a tragedy. What a joke. Sorry means you don't do it again. We are sick of hearing this country saying sorry and continuing the genocide that started over 200 years ago. The minister had the gall to give his non-answer to this chamber with one of the royal commissioners, Senator Dodson, present. Words are cheap. And this government's words are even cheaper. They spend thousands on an empathy consultant and that's the best they can do? Either this government is beyond help or the consultant wasn't any good. The government is always rolling out their absolutely discredited, dodgy Deloitte review into the implementation of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody to congratulate themselves for implementing the recommendations. Well, that review is wrong. The review did not consult with Aboriginal people or Aboriginal organisations. It was a desktop review. Deloitte's review counted government action towards implementing a recommendation as having completed the recommendation. They couldn't even get this right. Let's be honest, they didn't even try. Yet they wheel out this absolutely dodgy review that was conducted in the dark just so they can pat themselves on the back to tell us that they're taking action and that they care and that our lives matter. And yet three Aboriginal people died in custody last week, in one week. Well, over 450 of us have died since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, and well over 580 Aboriginal people have died in the last 40 years. Not enough action, otherwise it wouldn't be happening. This country over-targets our people and has been doing so since the colonial project began in this country. Surely that constitutes ongoing genocide of this country's sovereign first peoples. Just some weeks ago, countries at the United Nations absolutely slammed this country for over-imprisoning our people. This country has targeted and over-imprisoned us more than any other people on earth. The world is watching, Australia. 
The number of First Nations women in custody in particular has been called one of the most challenging human rights issues facing Australia. Our women in this country represent the largest cohort of imprisoned people in the country, comprising approximately 34 per cent of the total number of female imprisoned people, despite making up only 2 per cent of the total population. Imprisoning our women, the keepers of our families, even for a day, causes immense distress and disturbance to family and community life. So many of our women are imprisoned for short sentences or non-violent offences. That is when they are actually sentenced because this country's prisons are heaving with thousands of unsentenced prisoners. This country is happy to be warehousing people in prison instead of supporting them out of poverty. Not surprising since the first thing that the white settlers did when they came to colonise was to turn our ancestral lands into prisons for their convicts. Not only are our women being warehoused in prison, they are subjected to ongoing violence when they are there, including sexual violence. And we already know that the Prime Minister doesn't care about that now, does he? Particularly when it's happening to black bodies. Our people have the answers and the solutions to ending our over-imprisonment. Come speak to us. Don't commission to Deloitte to do a nonsense review so that you can pat yourselves on the back while hundreds of us are dying in prison cells. Shame. The question is the motion moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given?